Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. And welcome to this week's Weekly Energy Boost. My name is Ellie Sheva, and I am here with David. Hello. We are also blessed, I want to say. Blessed is the problem. Blessed word. by the presence <laughs> of someone we've been trying to get on the show for the duration of the show, I would like to say. Marcus Weston, who is one of our teachers from New York, and we're, M Marcus, we're very excited to have you on the show. And Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we're we're going to hear a lot from Marcus soon. I, I know that some of you may be joining us this week for your first weekly energy boost, and what we do here every week is we provide a spiritual energy forecast for the coming seven days. The way that we do that is through sifting through volumes of Kabbalistic wisdom, to provide the most practical, the most powerful, and the most beautiful. <laughs> let's, let's bring some Libra energy into the conversation, the most beautiful wisdom and tools for you, not only to use for the coming seven days, but also to be able to take into your life for the entire, for your entire life, for the entire year. And this, this week is particularly, I would say it's one of the most important weeks of the year, according to the Kabbalistic calendar. We often talk, I guess once, once a month, we talk about the new moon, the new moon of Libra, which is tonight, if you're, if you're watching, actually, if you're watching on Sunday, it's tonight. If you're watching any other day this week, it is it's Sunday not night. Tonight. It's not tonight. It's Sunday night through Tuesday night is not only the new moon of Libra, but it's also what the Kabbalists call the birth of humanity. And you may have heard the term Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah. It's the, it means the head of the year. But Kabbalistically, we understand this Sunday night to Monday is actually the day on which humanity was created. It is the birthday of humanity and therefore a renewal of energy for all of mankind, regardless of religion, race. Right. This is way beyond religion. Right. And, and what we can, you know, you can look into Kabbalistic work to better understand how it, ca it went from the birth of humanity to what most people see as the Jewish New Year. Right. Um, I don't know that it was we're preserved by the Jews, but that doesn't mean it belongs to the Jews right. primarily, right? It's a day where every soul is affected, every soul is audited. Um, w there must be an accounting for all the positive and negative in order to fashion the new destiny for the coming year. So we all have the appropriate challenges and the appropriate uh, cause and effect to whatever we did the prior exactly. year. Exactly, and that um, the the typically on a show we'll focus on what to do in the new moon and what the energy of the month is. I think we'll go from energy of the month to what to do this week. Yeah. The, the fact that this month is what we call Libra, or the, the sign is of the scales, shows you that every day this month, something is laying in the balance. Right. There's a different energy, a different blend, uh, blessing or abundance is being measured for each one of us. And again, this is all mankind, this is not, uh, a specific group if you if you behaved or if you didn't behave it's everybody right. the the tendency of a libra and we're all going to become a little libra this month is to judge is it right they're very very much in tune and drawn to justice um d is it fair right fair. The, the, fair the worst word we can use in spirituality is right. it fair right and, and we've we've talked about that many times david always says you know don't don't call the irs on anyone because the irs is then going to look into your files that is a message for not only all librans but all of us during the month of libra the focus for all of us the kabbalists teach is audit yourself don't be busy looking into anyone else's books but your own books right. and that takes a lot of <laughs> integrity and honesty and and self-reflection there david was talking uh, on the way here about the three different times where that auditing on some level takes place right right right, right. which we'll get into we'll get, at some point i want to talk about the three times in our lives and that there is a judgment or there is a spiritual audit from the universe's point of view that uh, we are held accountable for both our positivity and our negativity so it's kind of like we like the IRS is not looking into you every day, right? They, they have a time in the year that you are chosen to be audited, uh, if you are even audited, right? But with spirituality, you're always audited, right? I don't know what the number is with the IRS. I think it's like one in 72 people maybe get audited. In spirituality, one in one people get audited. and 100% <laughs> yes. of people and get audited. And there are three audited. times that we'll right. talk about during the show. So just make sure you're, you're, you're staying tuned so we can talk about it. But it's important to know what these three times are because 
you can clean up your books, your spiritual books, you can do self-reflection, you can do inner transformation before these three times of auditing come. Because once they come, you can't change it anymore. You are given the bill, you are given the penalties, you are given whatever the you're given. The decree is executed. Yeah, exactly. And so Kabbalists teach that from Sunday night until Tuesday night, there 48 are hours. 48 hours where we spend immersed in, in a, a, a unique spiritual light. Most Kabbalists will be praying, meditating. We, there's even specific foods that the Kabbalists teach that, that we can eat to draw down and digest that powerful energy. Whether or not you're able to participate in one of those such connections, the truth is you can stream with us. Uh, we can post the link now in the in the comments so that if you are listening and you don't have a, a meditation planned for the next two days, you can join us online when students and staff from around the world get together for this. We, Rav Berg used to call it a, like a spiritual surgery mm -hmm. where we're really uh, executing, uh, creating for ourselves a different year, a different script for the coming year. Absolutely. Let's, well, you know, let, I want to hear a little bit from Marcus and uh, to talk about, you may know Marcus from, if you've gone to our, maybe our YouTube channel, I have right here, our YouTube channel. Marcus, You yes. know, Marcus is the face. The first video you see here is, is Marcus talking about the Kabbalah Center. And it's not just because Americans trust people with uh, British, British accents. accents or cardigans <laughs> and cashmere sweaters, right. which is which is uh, the staple. It doesn't of hurt. Let's yeah. put it, it that way. It doesn't hurt, right? You automatically assume whatever he's saying is no, accurate but we and have true. a very international audience, so yes. they might have the, not have those same uh, judgments. I, 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 <laughs> but, but Marcus's death goes way beyond that. Uh, I've known him for, I would say, almost 20 years now. Uh, we started together in the Kabbalah Center in Los Angeles. Uh, he, Marcus comes from a business background uh, as a former investment banker that turned a spiritual tycoon, and he teaches all around the world. And he brings, you know, all the teachers that we have at the Kabbalah Center, they all have a different special, like, X-Men quality. Uh, that's their <laughs> talent. That's their forte. That's what we go to them for, right? Everyone has something unique that, that they specialize in. And Marcus has been uh, an incredible bridge between the spiritual and the physical world and the business world for, for thousands of our community members. Thousands all of the years. World. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy's got probably 30,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one spiritual coaching under his belt. And, uh, spiritual and business coaching Spiritual as business well. coaching, yeah, 30,000 hours, right? We talked about many shows ago about what it means to be an expert. Right, it was yeah. Malcolm, and Malcolm Gladwell wrote about it in the book um, Outliers that when you, to really be an expert in something, to excel, and he used the example of the Beatles and different, you know, un, unbelievable yeah. it, it, people who are unbelievable in their field, they-, they Need at least 10,000 10, And they used to, apparently, they used to just sit and get a stage and play for like seven, eight hours in bars and yeah. just racking up those hours. Here we have Marcus Weston who has racked up well beyond his 10,000 hours <laughs> in, in providing guidance and insight to people who are looking to apply those spiritual principles not only to their daily lives but to one of the most difficult areas to apply spirituality right. in and business. I, and I've asked Marcus, maybe g give us your top three, top three business advice uh, concepts that you might give to everyone from Fortune 500 CEOs to to just, you know, the guy who's trying to create a startup, <clears throat> the guy, or <clears throat> sorry, the man or woman who's trying to create a startup. Uh, so hopefully he'll share that. So stay tuned for that. Marcus, anything you want to say, you want to start sharing either about Libra What's coming up this well, week? Wait a second. I, I think it's a good time to pause also and ask everybody who's listening. Yeah. If you know someone who needs to hear, A, how important this week is spiritually, globally, right. for all humanity, or if you know somebody who needs some more spirituality in their business ethic, yeah. share the show with them now. If, if you're on Facebook, that's one way. You can also share the show on iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and you can also find the show on the Kabbalah Center International channel on YouTube. Absolutely, great. So, Marcus, without further ado, Say yeah, hello to everybody. I think I'll be off now. <laughs> after, after that introduction. Hey, everything from that moment on is downhill, right? the best ever. I hope my wife's watching. <laughs> all those extraordinary accolades Superlative. You are superlative, well, We already Marcus. talked about it. I think we, it's all downhill from now. You're that was the, a big bar. Well, you could just recite your, the alphabet and people will be impressed. So go right ahead. <laughs> Anything in a cashmere sweater and a British yeah, accent sounds really, nice. Considering we lost our empire to you. And it's held in such a court. Anyway. Um, no, I think it's very exciting to be here. I will say that to start with. 
I think um, I, I actually heard about you mostly from the Philippines. I was in the Philippines recently, and and they have a phenomenal center there. And two of the leaders there, Val and um, and uh, and Ruth, if you're both watching, um, were looking at the the podcast that you you have. And I think half the country watches you. <laughs> Everyone was talking about, wow, have you seen, have you seen, have you seen, Gem? So, so you're very popular. We're really popular in the Catholic countries, especially. Big in Asia. Yeah, big in Asia. Big in Asia. Anyway, it's a great honor to be here. And, um, and yes, you've talked about so many things. I'm not sure where to start. So, so just one, one thought I had when you were talking about um, the, the, the powerful week that we're coming into. It's a reset button. For me, it's a reset button. And I think that's really powerful because... You know, you, you have in, 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 in relationships or in business, if you're, if you're playing a game at something, as you said about Gladwell, you have to play it 10,000 times to become relatively good. And yet when you get married, you haven't got 10,000 goes. <laughs> or when you start a business, you haven't got 10,000 chances. Right. And yet with life, you get this reset every single year. And, and that's really powerful because what's happening is you're getting the ability to, to go back to square one and not lose any of the upside of anything you've done before, but you get to clean all the downside. And it's a kind of very interesting audit because the bailiffs do come after you. I think left alone, if you're on your own cause and effect path, I think the bailiffs can come and find you eventually. The spiritual bailiffs, you're yeah. saying. Yeah. And, 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 and that kind of spiritual debt in the year, right? Because if you're, if you're net negative, the bailiff has to somehow take something. So, so what if somebody's not doing any spiritual work, right? They have no consciousness about the universe, the light of the creator, uh, transformation. They're just trying to be the best version of themselves. Here comes the first two days of Libra, these 48 hours. What's, how is that different than someone who's more cognizant working on themselves? What's the difference here? Well, I think, I think whoever you are, you're working on yourself. Whether, whether, whether you've come to the Kabbalah Center or a thousand other good places to, to, to transform, you cannot not change, mm -hmm. right? That's just the inevitability. Death and taxes are quite avoidable these days. <laughs> so, so the one thing you can't avoid is change. So whoever you are, life and circumstances are going to create a necessary transformation, evolution in the self. So, so it might weigh big without even knowing any Kabbalah. You are changing. You're on a great path. You've learned a thousand lessons and, and you're kind of immersing yourself in, in that transformative uh, um, version of you every single year. I think what, what the center does, or what we do, is we, we keep you ahead of that curve. Mm. So life hasn't got to teach you in a way which can be harsher. You learn proactively and you can stay ahead of, of otherwise quite difficult challenges. So, so that for me is, is um, uh, it's a gift in the year. It's like a, a reset button. And that by the way, it's not, this, it's not only these 48 hours, it's also the the entire week from basically from t from Sunday That's night true. until <clears throat> next Wednesday night. And we'll talk about how next week affects us next Sunday. But that there is a, every single moment gives you an opportunity to reset something, some aspect of whatever, like you said, wasn't amazing in the previous year to get back to zero and be able to to build. Our audience loves bite sized secrets. Tell me what to do. What would you say is the one thing, bite-sized secret, you know, this is what they're listening for, that they can do in these next uh, 10 days uh, that could really transform their destiny? Because like Alicia has said, it's heightened. Whatever you do during these 10 days, it's magnified thousandfold versus any other time of the year. Bite-sized consciousness, a life hack. What would you tell our audience to do in the next 10 days that you think is powerful? For me, spiritual audit. Do your own spiritual, spiritual audit. Spiritual audit. It's the time in the year when you, you need to do your, your taxes, your spiritual audit means you really have to pause for a second. You have to take a time out, which very few of us are good at. We're, every we're day? Would you say every day to take that time out this, in these 10 days? Well, we've got some hours left before a new year kicks, but certainly so there's but a creation. It's definitely order. before tonight, if you're hearing this on Sunday. And before. if not, then for sure, as you say, in the next week before next Wednesday. Okay. Um, and that audit needs to include everything about yourself certainly in your relationships with others, which is where life shows up, I think, um, as, as a, a deep message. And, and if you really stop and think about what energy you're putting out there, um, what relationships you've created, what achievements you've created. Most people have 20, 30, 40 years pass as a whirlwind, and you look back and you think, what on earth has happened? Where has everything gone? 
What have I really achieved? Have I really hit the goals as a kid I dreamt of? Have I really created the relationships that I dreamt of as a teenager or, or a child? And, and very often life gets the better of us. And it's not from, from bad intention, but I think that spiritual audit, that moment when you can just pause and take a time out and reflect and be introspective and really look inside and find what are the things that I'm not showing up and changing? Where am I not showing up in my marriage, as a leader, oh, as a friend, good. whatever it may be? That's and in good. my head, I think I'm kind of okay, right? There's a great article in the Tsar, actually. It says, do you act in accordance with your desires? Hmm. So as you walk into Rosh Hashanah, most of us have wishes, right? But wishes are very different to work. In other words, most of us on a birthday, we might make a whole wish or a resolution list in the new year. But are you working? Are you creating the change necessary for that light to drop? Or are you just wishing for it? and staying as lazy or as passive as you were yesterday. I, I, I want to cut in here because Marcus says something interesting. Hold yourself accountable in marriage, as a leader, as a friend, maybe as a business owner. I think it sounds or good. Or employee, as of an course. Employee. Yeah, right. <laughs> it sounds great, but you know, I think we should tell people, well, this is, this, this is how you know if you're not showing up, right? Any area in your life where there's difficulty or chaos, or difficulty or chaos, and it's not smooth, you're not hitting those green lights, there's something wrong there. And I think what we've always said is, you know, th who's the best business owner? The, when, when, whenever a business owner is the least knowledgeable person in the room, that's how, you know, that's how you know he's a good business owner. Because he's not lording himself over his employees. He's not controlling them. He's not shutting them up. He's listening to them. And a spiritual audit, let's say as, as a leader or a business owner, is to ask your employees, you know, what is it that I need to change? What is it that I can do to be a better leader? And to be vulnerable in, with your spouse and say, okay, if there's one thing I can do better as a spouse, what would that be? And, and to do that in the next six hours. And by the way, it doesn't matter when you're hearing this show because people hear this show all the time. You may be hearing times. this show in August 2020. Yeah, that's it's fine. It's still good advice. That, that, it's, still, it's still good advice because we have the yearly audit, but we also have a daily audit and right. we have a lifetime audit, which we're going to talk about. So because I think people want to know, all right, great, I want to do that. They're motivated. They want to be a better, all these things that Marcus said. But they need, like, they just need to know, all right, so what do I do to know where I'm deficient? All right, so, so I, I would say, you know, just simply asking is, is a great starting point in all these areas of life. And we all have blind spots. We all think we're doing great in one area, and actually, you know, everyone hates us in that area. I, 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 to borrow from David's language, go for the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the easiest way to, to go about the process. Yeah. I you, think it's important also that, that when, when, you, when you do that audit, and as you say, where there's a red flag or there's some chaos or some challenges, and and you therefore you find some place where as you say something is wrong it's very important not to bounce off the ego and think something is wrong with me right something is wrong in the way i'm carrying out or i'm doing or i'm attending or i'm focusing or i'm uh, doing perhaps many many things but nothing is wrong with me Right. Yeah, I think that's important for people to know because they beat themselves up. Well, okay. we're not audit doesn't mean beat yourself up. Yes. We we talked about that a lot over the last few weeks with the Virgo energy, having the the inner critic and the it, it feels very spiritual often to to feel guilty or to shame yourself. That looks like taking responsibility, but it's not taking responsibility. It's paralyzing. Right. Beating yourself up is mm. not a spiritual. It's not act. helping anybody. Right. It's be, the the when you do recognize something that you could be doing better or a missed opportunity the approach is okay i did it and therefore i can change it even though in that moment it may look like well i said what i said or i did what i did by changing me who i am now and how i go about that relationship or that project or that that even that part of my own self-growth i shift what happened back then that my old self would beat myself up about yeah and it's interesting because a person with with huge ambition or someone who's got gr far greater goals is going to hit many more challenges, awakening the changes necessary to achieve those goals. The fact that I've hit a wall doesn't mean I'm bad or it's bad. Actually can be a signpost, you're on the right track here. You've just hit a life inflection point, which you can pivot now to achieve the greater goals you have, without which you might not have had those goals. Life might have been more coasting, but that creates, in my point of view, a depressing life of low achievement, 
or low acceptance with smaller fruits. But that that also comes from the fact that when you when someone think when we think about what's my purpose, people often think that their purpose is outside of them. I haven't found my purpose. I haven't found my calling. I haven't found the charity I'm supposed to open or the product I'm supposed to invent. Kabbalah teaches that your purpose is you. Your, that transformation, that elevation, that growth. And if you were meant to open up a, a company that provide, you know, for every sh pair of shoes bought, a pair of shoes goes to someone in need, that's the platform for the growth. And, the, and creating the company is the purpose, not the actual shoes themselves. All right, so let, let, let's, let's focus it here so, so our, our audience can ta have, a, have a good takeaway here, right? We've talked about self-reflection. I wrote several points here that we all just said. This is what we need to take away. Number one, do self-reflection. Look inside yourself. Pray. Talk to the Creator. Talk to your soul. These ten days. These right? ten not, days. Not just this. Yeah. Two, this forty-eight hour window. It's m much more magnified. But we do have the opportunity all the way through next Wednesday. Right. Even if you're not to blame, take responsibility. If there's a friend that has hurt you and you're waiting for that apology, if there's a, if there's a situation that someone's cheated you, if there's a situation where you feel like there's space with another individual. It's not about who's right or wrong or fair, which is the anti-Libra, which is the whole, the way to fall into chaos this month. Right. It's to f somehow say, all right, what can I do to just be a better version of myself, to be more like the light of the creators we learned in Kabbalah? Yeah, and I would Find what something. that is. I'd add some, because I think sometimes self-reflection can be very, meta Libra can space out a little mm -hmm. bit, right? right? They live upstairs. All the holidays, all the connections in Libra are very much upstairs connections. Mm -hmm. And their, their problem actually is to be grounded mm -hmm. in terms of decision, left or right, they, they, they are challenged. And, and so I think in terms of self-reflection, it's not just an, an awareness inside and a kind of interesting moment Write it to down. pause. Strategize. I think it has to be inner conviction. Good. Because the conviction is the awakening of the work that's going to create the change. That's, that's true because there, so many people have this nice idea of what they need to change. But when you are, are, com when you are committed to overcoming something, that's when everything, you know, comes together to help you do it. Yeah, you I mean, have to have inner conviction. I find in, in, in businesses, there are people who wish and there are people who work. <laughs> there are wishes and workers. And, and those that wish have always something to cl complain about and always wish for. And those that work are too busy to complain or moan or wish, but they achieve. And and that's the pivot for me in, in, that's, in the reflection. That's beautiful. And I think people don't know how many rewards are waiting for them when they actually transform this negativity, right? The, well, our, one of the great Kabbalists, the RE, told his student, Chaim Vital, the reason why you don't have your soulmate is simply because you have anger issues. As soon as you overcome your anger issues, you're going to find your soulmate. And that's what happened, right? So some of us don't realize that this, this lack of fulfillment in some area, poverty, can't pay my bills, can't find my soulmate, can't get pregnant, can't find you know the right friendships, the right community, the right you know I'm not happy where I'm living, might just boil down to that one insecurity you have, that one anger well, issue you have, that one you control issue. You bring up something very important for this month as well. Often it's a very Libran thing, like you said, the indecisiveness. You if you do that inner reflection and you come up with the laundry list of things that you can work on and changes you can make that list can be daunting and paralyzing. Right. So you can look at that list and say, well, why bother? I would, yeah, I would not create a big list. I would focus on one thing, one thing. and go right at one it. Thing. And here's what's interesting. The creator doesn't actually want you to change everything at once because you can't. You can't go in six directions at the same time, right? If you're traveling north, you can't be traveling north and south simultaneously. But we do think we can handle you know, five different issues at once. You gotta take one thing and you gotta focus on it, direct 100% of your energy. Some, nothing happens unless you put 100% in, right? And to, to know that your reward could be huge. Your reward, it, it's, it's unbelievable because the gates I've seen, the gates from people, the gates of wealth, the gates of love, the gates of peace of mind, right? People have insomnia. They can't sleep at night. Some people have eczema. They can't get these rashes off their body. Some people have neck pain, back pain. They've been seeing every chiropractor there is. And all that it really requires is, you know what? You have, you, you have, you have a lack of self-love, right? Change it. Once you change that, back pain goes away. And Once not, you change it, skin issues David, go away. When David says change it, he's not talking about 180. The, the breakthrough doesn't, doesn't need to come at 180. It can come at three degrees. Exactly. It's the fact that we take that focus like a laser 
Really, yeah. that's that's why why the Rav calls it spiritual surgery. You can focus all of your energy directly to one area, and what ends up happening is you think it's fifteen issues, but it's really probably one or two. Exactly. And the moment you begin to work wholly and fully on one, the other ones also start to shift, and sometimes just disintegrate some people have issues with their children right they're, they they just can't mend this relationship with their children uh the children don't respect them it can boil down to one of the negative attributes that maybe you don't even you don't even show your children it could be something that you a way you act with your your spouse or a way that you act with your employees that negative issue is causing your child to be estranged from you you know it's so tied together and we have to that's the power and the exciting thing of taking responsibility I remember with, our, with the teachers getting together, when we were prepared for this day, we were prepared months in advance. It's because we selfishly want more pleasure and more miracles, and we know it is a direct correlation and direct function of, of reducing and transforming gradually uh, all of our negative attributes that we talked about. And you know what? Can I just run down all the negative attributes real quick that could exist? Because sometimes people also go into the Libra state, as Marcus says, right? Because there's four I'm categories. I'm a bad person. That's yeah, a Libra yeah, thing. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm just a bad person, or I'm just selfish. That's a very... Yeah. Try, Libra's value, isn't it? Yeah. I have no value. Try, what is my value as well? Try to identify you know, something, and a, this could be a, a whole, this could be 100 glasses, but I just want to fire them off. People can connect with them. We have uh, four categories that actually corresponds to all the astro astrological signs. Fire, air, water, earth, right? Fire, we got, we got pride. I mean, each one of these is a whole other class by itself. Pride, anger, control, hatred, or judgment. That's the first category of negative attributes. The second category is all forms of evil speech, right? That evil speech can be... Oh gosh! We have class. We have we have shows. That I'm saying, David's saying you could go back into our archive and look yes. up shows on all of the things that all David is topics. listing off now. If you so. need a specialty, if you need to go deeper into it, all forms of evil speech. That's the air category. The water category. It's all forms. We talked of, about that earlier this summer. That's right. Lusts, desires that aren't good for you, addictions, jealousy, and envy. That'll be the third category. Fourth category or relating around earth signs is some form of laziness, procrastination, avoiding what you know you need to do, sadness, not taking responsibility, uh, casting that blame on other people, uh, the, the lack of desire to be spiritual. So these are all different types of areas and qualities that we could be nourishing and uh, feeding this negativity that we could take responsibility for at least one of them. I know amongst the teachers we said, you know what, let's really watch our speech for six weeks. Six weeks leading to this, let's just really watch ourselves. And you could watch yourself in the next 10 days. Be careful what you say. Be careful who you talk about. Any word that comes out of your mouth that's not building is probably destroying. Don't waste your words. Don't hurt people. You know, all, all of that stuff. So, Somebody actually posted a comment on uh, one of our shows a few weeks back, a question that she said, um, how, how, if I'm so carefully watching what I say, what happens to my sense of humor? I can't be sarcastic. <laughs> I can't make jokes. And and I don't. I think it was on your feed. I didn't go to answer that particular question. But I think that that's mm. a, a very profound way to look at it. Is is are those things that I'm sharing necessary? Are they important? Or are they creating some sort of ego based version or perception of what I th I think or I want people to feel from me? And I thought that that was such a profound question because so much of those behaviors, like you just listed off a whole lot of, <laughs> a lot of garbage. A whole lot of garbage. That many people out there probably define themselves by. Mm. I'm a procrastinator. I'm an angry person. I'm a, I, I just get depressed, right? Or we, there's, you know, up and down the gamut. Those, imagine yourself maybe, to, if, if you did identify one of the, with one of the things that David said, imagine yourself without that quality without that title, I'm, I'm just an angry person, or my father was angry, so I learned from, you know, take that title off of your C, your resume, your CV, who would you be? Oh, Marcus, what Elisheva just said is a question we get a lot, especially in Kabbalah one. People come, they're optimistic about transforming, they hear about all these spiritual rules, and the first thing they say is, well, wait, wait, if I do all this, you know, am I gonna lose my identity, or what's gonna happen after, or this, that, and the other thing, right? They're asking these questions before they actually go through the process. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, t t what do you tell these students who are already trying to predict their future, <laughs> right, before they've even actually began that it's spiritual It's a valid journey? concern. It, it's a valid concern. Yeah. Am I going to lose my sense of humor if all of a sudden I watch what I say, right? How would you address that with students? So, again, my, my default is always business. I, I, I learn so much from business. For me, 
It's simple. It's a trade. It's a trade. Everything in life is a trade, right? So I, 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 had a, I was giving a lecture once at a, um, it was a Scottish right wow. Masons. Oh, yeah, Masons. Masons. The Masons. Right? Yes, yes. Yes. So Freemasons in in London, and a guy at the end came up to me, and was talking about. A horrendous event that happened to him and his family and it truly was horrendous and he was saying how he could not not hate because and, and if you heard the story it would be very difficult to not feel uh, at least his hatred and his hatred towards one person a group of people a group of people a group of people basically hurt him and his family yes you can't you can't say more than that I'm right just, I'm so so what was apparent after about five minutes of, of pushing him, of, of asking him questions, was that he knew no life without hatred. Mm. And actually, hatred gave him a reason to feel passion, to feel somehow alive. Have a it, purpose. Was his, it was his purpose. Mm. And if you took that away from him, he had no purpose. He had mm. no passion. It was like retaliation. Right. His life was retaliation yeah. for what was done. So you and were telling him, him to take his purpose away pretty much, it gave right? him meaning. It's, yes. And so suddenly, if I'm to study, it's a trade. Do you want your meaning to come from things that will, 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 will mean negative things for you and others? Or do you want your meaning to rebrand and reclassify as something that can feed you and really mm. excite you? And it's a trade. And like everything in, in spiritual work, are you willing to trade your achievement for your laziness? Are you willing to change, trade your... your, your fear of confrontation for a threat of popularity. It's a trade. Everything comes down to that, that bottom line trade where there's a belief system inside that, that somehow I think firing me up or giving me something that, that energizes me or gives me some purpose, but it's very rarely true. I want to add to what Marcus said because, uh, you know, for example, I remember somebody who had a tumor, developed a tumor in their body, so the, they tried to holistically take care of it. And holistically, they said you know, lay off of sugar, right? So, because the tumor feeds off of sugar, lay off of sugar. So the first thing she said, wait, so I can never have sugar again? And that wasn't, that wasn't the response. The response was, let's, let's try a diet, right? And, and this person went on an extreme, extreme diet and actually the tumor went away. But without sugar, let's say for 60 days. Now, once the tumor's gone, she started to adjust back to a healthy diet that included sugar, right? So what does that mean? Because sometimes, especially with diets, we all freak out. We say, oh my God, you know, am I gonna have to stop this forever? Your sense of humor, a lot of times people use their sense of humor from a place of lack, from a place of needing approval. Right. Which right? is, again, another big Libra. A, a huge, Libras a huge are the Libra classical thing. people pleasers. What if, you know, I, I do hear a lot of time from students, well, if I change, what if people don't like the exactly. new me? Exactly. Right? Exactly. What if my husband doesn't like the better me? And here's what's amazing. We're not, in Kabbalah, we never tell people to actually change their essence, right? If you're a funny guy, you got to stay a funny guy. All we're saying is we can't, we got to get rid of the tumor that's causing you to be funny. So maybe for 40 days, you do need to keep your mouth shut so you can start to acknowledge the pain inside you, why you do what you do, why are you looking for attention, why are you looking to please everyone. Once you take responsibility for that and uproot it, you can go back to making jokes, go back to being funny, and it's going to be even more powerful now because your audience is no longer you're going to feel you're taking from them. But your audience is going to feel like you're giving to them. And we learned this in public speaking. Our teachers, I remember, told Marcus and I in the very beginning, what makes a good public speaker or a teacher? Uh, and this is good for anybody who wants to get into public speaking or anybody who needs to talk to an audience, even if that audience is one person. It's less about the content of what you say. People hear what you People hear what's inside you. They don't hear what you say. They hear Something like 27% of whatever you're going to say is actually going to be retained anyway. Exactly. It's the energy. Less, so, I think. Literally 9%. 9%. Right, seven to 9% I, I That's saw That's crazy. Yeah, so if Marcus, and I, communication. if Marcus and I are going to get on a stage and a part of us wants the audience to like us or we need the approval of the audience to be happy or to feel fulfilled, then we're takers, not givers. But if we could come on that stage and not even care if the whole class was asleep or the whole class loved us, it made no difference to our internal happiness, then we are givers because then everything we say and do is coming from a place of giving. But how many times do we use our audience, do we use our customers, do we use our spouse, do we use our friends to fill a need because we're not happy? Instead, it, it, and as a result, it's not true giving. 
and this is a, this is a this is very deep. It's very powerful. Like if you want to be a giver, you got to remove the spiritual tumor inside you. So, can you make jokes? Of course you can make jokes. Can you have a sense of humor? Of course you can. But as Marcus said, what you're trading is a temporary trade. You're letting go of that the your 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 the way you are being funny because it's coming from the wrong place. Transform the seed level negative negative tumor, the spiritual tumor, which is your need for approval. Let's say. And then when you feel like you don't need anyone's approval, go back to being funny because now you really want to just give your audience. Okay. D two, what, I have questions. How much time do we have left? We have about 14 minutes or so. Okay. Um, one of the things you said, and I think that we, it's, it's almost like we've been, we've been saying the same sentence over and over again. We have to finish the sentence. We do the spiritual audit. We identify it's the anger or it's the laziness or it's the people pleasing. Whatever it is that we want to have that laser focus on. What do you do? It's not that, you know, you can't just suddenly stop people pleasing. It doesn't doesn't work like that. What are some practical steps we can give our listeners to implementing the new me technology, to, to being that new person? I'll tell you one idea, one idea. Again, for me, it's not simple, it's not real. So in that spiritual <laughs> audit, that. I think you have to have uncomfortable conversations. Because the introspection or With the who? self With respect who? well, depending on the audit, let's see, right? Okay. But 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 you're gonna go inside of yourself and you're gonna realize certain things and you're going to perhaps either sink into depression or excite yourself with a change that you maybe wish for and it's too internal. I think the second that you you can channel that and and it's quite scary to do so sometimes, and you actually get yourself through a spiritual process, which we can talk about to have that uncomfortable conversation like with a confession. someone. It's almost a confession without that nasty religious connotation right. to it, right? Um, it's, the, it's taking accountability, being, sure. being this, is, this is my work, yes. help me be accountable to it. Yeah, right. Confe and, confession is the first step. And okay. I think, but if confession is too early, if you've not gone through the internal work, the confession is useless. The confession is about your own ego. I want you to forgive me just so you forgive me, not that anything has changed inside of me. I want to feel better, not because I've changed, just because you see me as an okay person now. So I think there has to be a, a genuine amount of internal work before that confession happens. But the, the idea of being able to have an uncomfortable conversation, to confront something, either to admit something or to, to build a bridge with someone or to correct a lost relationship with someone. There are, there are probably a good too many people who we know that we have some movie about or with. <laughs> and, and that movie spirals to become so dangerous and then it becomes real in our own minds and then we share that with others mm. to cement it and then suddenly it's this grounded chaos Whereas the second you confront the person or you call the person or you share your movie with the person, it disintegrates. What if the person is dead? Well, you can still have the conversation. Okay. Right? I just wanted to clarify because <laughs> I know we get comments about that. You still have the conversation. You have the conversation as if you're calling the person with the person upstairs. Right. And, and just, to, just to be clear, if the person's alive, it's case by case. Sometimes you feel the need to actually confess to the person or you can confess to the spirit of the person who is also alive, right? It's kind of like, because I, you know, for example, let's say the person you hurt is your ex-girlfriend and you're married now. I don't know if how appropriate it is not appropriate. For, your, for your wife to find, you go to your wife yeah. and say, listen, I feel like I got some work I still got to do with my exactly. ex-girlfriend. I'm going to go confess. I love you so much. Yes, yeah, I love you. Know, <laughs> I really love you. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, <laughs> just, just the hiatus here for a moment. Nobody should be talking to their ex-girlfriends. Let's just, just put it out there. If you're married. If you're already moved on or ex-boyfriends, nine out of nine out of nine, <laughs> nine out of eight times, <laughs> nine out of eight times, that's usually coming from a place of lack of insecurity. Yes. And it's your own personal way of trying to be connected to the past. Yeah. And uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting because a psychological study done that people heal more from when you say I'm sorry versus I'm sorry. I hope you forgive me. And, and, and the concept is I hope you forgive me. It's all about you. Mm. Right. Saying I'm sorry is really just, you know, to, for their pain. That, that's, a, that's a separate topic. But I like what Marcus has said. I want to add one thing to it, and then we need to ask him about the three business concepts. And we still got to talk about the three, three, we, the three judgments. And we do not have time. And we do not have time. So we are going to do it quick. The final thing is, after your confession, 
you need to know that the spiritual process begins with just consciousness and awareness, which usually is a period of time of you just watching yourself fail in that area. So if you're looking to transform your need for approval, first couple months even, what you're going to experience is all the things that you do that look for approval and you're going to fail. And you can ask in your meditations, you can ask the creator to show you all of the ways right. that you seek approval, all of the subtle ways, all of the obvious ways, all of the ways from 20 years ago that you did it, all of the ways right. from you want to, because in order to remove that spiritual term, you have to see how far it spread. Right. And I think people need to know first, you're going to watch yourself failing a lot, right? I think people think like, okay, I'm cognizant now I shouldn't be doing it. No, you're cognizant of how much you're going to fail at it for the first couple of months. Don't be depressed at it. Be excited. Again, it's not bad. That's thing. an awareness thing, right? You, you didn't catch yourself before now you're catching yourself exactly. so even if it's after the fact you're still more advanced than you were that's before much you more advanced and eventually then you just stop it because you realize how much pain it's causing you in your soul and then it just stops and that's and that's the process because mm -hmm. i think i just wanted people to really know that when you transform something first you fail at it a thousand times before you just realize that this is not this is not supporting me i want i don't want this anymore okay Top three business concepts, Marcus. We could talk about this forever. So, G give so us a couple of things that you've noticed that can really let me, help. Let people. me say one thing, which just bounced off what you're saying, which was also a business concept. You, you said to succeed at something, you might have to fail a thousand times. Yes. And I think that is a business concept because I think one of the things that we we are not great at is the definition of what success is and what failure is. So. If I'm succeeding at something, I have to fail a thousand times. Naturally most people are not going to want to fail a thousand times and won't push full force to get to that 1000th moment of success. Mm -hmm. I think what we do badly sometimes is we, we, we define failure as something external which has failed mm -hmm. and success as something external which has succeeded. And I think that's flawed because many successes can create downtimes right? You can feel that you have a windfall of something and it create a slow demise because it creates complacency or comfort or laziness mm -hmm. um, or arrogance. And I think sometimes by contrast, you can fail at something external and it awaken so much change and so much um, positive transformation that it is been successful. So the first thing I would do is redefine success and failure as internal change. Mm -hmm. If it internally provokes change and you've successfully changed because of it externally, that is successful period. And what it's going to create externally is going to show success. I think if you're somehow failing, it is not externally based. It is internally based that you are refusing to look at an external event, difficult event, and find some inner responsibility or own what's happened and thereby remove the light of success from that moment. So, so I don't think I like change it. or success is this 1,000th step on the mountain. Uh, I think it's a constant process. Everybody has a toxic and unhealthy relationship with failure. To yeah. increase your chances of success, you yeah. have to increase your frequency of failure. And we talked about uh, a fr the friend of mine who, who, who wanted to come up with a product to sell, so he launched 100 products. He, and he saw that three of them became successful, and he lost a lot of money doing it, but now he runs a successful company with three products, as opposed to the other person who's trying to find the perfect three products and is in paralysis and is afraid- and doesn't uh, launch anything. Doesn't launch anything for four anything years for four until years. everything comes back. Meanwhile, this other guy's, you know, he, he, he's crushing it. So it's very important that we are so comfortable with failure. In fact, we look forward to it. We look forward to negative feedback. We look forward to rejection. The more, the faster because you make that failure. process. Right, it's not really failure, that's right, exactly. Yeah. Change your unhealthy relationship with failure. All right, that's, yeah. that's, a, great, that's a great concept. You have another one for us? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the main thing when I go into businesses that we always end up talking about is the ego, which is a subject that will take 20,000 more sessions to really um, uh, understand. But I'm fascinated by it. I think that is my passion point of life. And certainly no one in, in, in at least in my research, has ever understood, defined, and measured ego in the same way the Kabbalists have, which is what makes the study of Kabbalah so extraordinary in the context of business. Because it seems that, that organizational change is inseparable from personal change. So where most people in businesses get very tactical and very intelligent and very strategic, it can sometimes be at the expense of the 
person evolution that will deliver that change. So they're ignoring the personal evolution. They're yeah. just focusing focusing on the business strategy. And exactly. th therefore, they can be doing everything right strategically yes. and it's not working. Yeah, and you'll see a business plan, which is genius, right? This is the Netflix or the Facebook or the Instagram. It's like, wow, I love that idea. It looks fantastic. And the, and the one page, it looks genius. And it's an amazing insight. It's got this tech add-on, which is so novel. It's not been done before. And the wrong management team, it just does not right. live for a second. Most of the VC companies tell me they don't put money in businesses, they put money in the management. And the management, and by the way, a lot of their VC investment is based on failure experience of management, mm -hmm. interestingly. That's not correct. just the CV of the manager. That's correct. Um, uh, so, so the root of ego, I think, is the, the first step of any leader to start to look inward and outward. You have to be someone that has that business savvy. You can't just be a, a kind of meditator that has an internal knowledge. But I think to understand and define what those pervading mindsets are within yourself and within your team, create breakthroughs. And that's my passion. And, and you know what? It's really popular days. I know you do it, Marcus, for, for, for big businesses, Fortune 500 companies, Marcus, uh, the spiritual consulting for. But I think in the same way people find value in having a business coach, then you need a spiritual coach that guides you, especially if you're running a company or a startup. Those two forces combined, right? I tell my students, you have a spiritual coach, which is usually you know one of us, a teacher, a spiritual teacher. It doesn't have to be obviously a Kabbalah teacher. It can be somebody else. Also a business coach, right? Having those two is going to streamline your path towards success because you need both. You need both to be successful and have longevity and be happy. Right? Sometimes it's easy to be successful at the expense of your happiness, at the expense of your family, because you don't have the spiritual Which is foundation. not so successful. I think that's actually what, what, what the, the next generation is teaching us, right? Because there's, there's a different work ethic, it seems, in the next generation coming. And, and I think what they're saying is that if it hasn't got value, I'm not in. Correct. Right? I've seen that too. And, and so everything has to have some kind of purpose, some kind of meaning. They're redefining what success means. Absolutely. Um, I love it. We have, we, like, have, we have like four minutes? No, not even. Oh, I, I promised it. I just want to tell them the three times we're being spiritually audited. Okay. We don't have to flesh it out. And then I'm going to end with a happy story so that everybody can go go home feeling good. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> Your ego. <laughs> Your ego. <laughs> fail. You must fail and fail and fail. Rotten, stinking hey, scoundrels. <laughs> we're all done. All, right. all right, fine. But bottom line is, we all need to be cognizant of the fact that there's three times in the year where we are audited. Number one is uh, it happens, like we said, every year during the first two days of Libra, for first 48 hours, also known as Rosh Hashanah, but it's a day for everyone. Number two, every time you go to sleep and your soul elevates, it's actually a moment of judgment. It's a moment of being spiritually audited for the last, uh, for the, final, the 24 hours prior. So whatever you did that day is being determined in the upper worlds as your soul elevates when you sleep. And then the new destiny is created for the next day. And that's why it's always good before you go to sleep to do another self-reflection and take responsibility and do all the things we talked about. And the final is when a person dies. That's why actually death is essential in this world because it really does a full audit of the entire life of a person based on the way they lived is the reincarnation process and the tikkuns and the corrections they need to make and the things they need to transform. And then that soul evolves into another lifetime. That's, I just wanted to share the basics. We can go into deeper re reincarnation concepts. I know people love Kabbalah and reincarnation. Maybe next in a, week. In another, in another Maybe class. Maybe next week. Okay. So first of all, Marcus, thank you. Anytime that you yeah. can get our side of the Midwest, we'd love to have you on the just, show. I know that just from the comments, everybody is completely blown away by your perspective. And I mean, you can find Marcus on Kabbalah.com, different classes our YouTube channel as well. He's right. on Instagram if you want to follow him there. And I don't know what his schedule is like, but uh, I've sent different clients and students to him who have big companies, and he comes in and he transforms it. He does executive business coaching with a spiritual twist. Doesn't even call it Kabbalah, but it's, kept, it's, it's a mix of a lot of things that you've gathered the last 25 years, and it is powerful. If so anybody, if, you're, if, anybody if you're interested out. in that, you can also email us at energyboost at Kabbalah.com. Don't forget we're on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, CastBox, and Stitcher, and of course YouTube. And on a high note, let's end mm -hmm. on a warm and fuzzy story. This is actually a, a quick story that uh, we often hear in these two days that are so crucial. When it's so hard, you know, ev with everything that you've shared, we've shared today, 
we want to do it quote unquote right, which is again, another Libra. I wanna get it right. I, I wanna make sure I don't make any mistakes. So the story is about a, a great uh, Kabbalist years ago who um, he had a, someone who was leading the meditations in his connections in these two days called Rosh Hashanah. And the person who prepared to, to lead everybody in those meditations created himself a, you know, a three by three chart of the proper meditations at the proper mm -hmm. timings with the proper letter combinations with the names of the angels with everything and he folded it up and he put it in his pocket and time came that morning let's say monday morning of this week to to get up before everybody and guide everybody leading the you know hundreds perhaps even thousands of people that got together with this great kabbalist to create a better year for themselves and he couldn't find the piece of paper mm. and he starts sweating and the sweat turns to tears and they, they, the show must go on. So they're doing the meditations and following the technology. But this guy who fasted for three days and, and he just did so much intense work to get it right and to be the channel he knew he needed to be. So they, they get through the meditations and he goes to his, the Kabbalist, his teacher, and he says, he, I'm He didn't use any of the meditations. No he meditations. Lost it. He, he lost was just it. shaking, sweating and crying <laughs> the entire day. Yeah. So he goes to his teacher and he says, I, I, I don't know what happened. I had all the meditations. I studied for months. I fasted. I, I purified myself in every way possible. I had every meditation known to mankind in front of me on my chart. And I don't know where it went. And the teacher puts his hand in his pocket and he pulls out the chart. Mm. And he said, you know, you're, the meditations are, are important and they're fine and they're good. And, and, and all those letters and calculations. But this year, what we needed was our meditations through tears and sweat and trembling. Mm. So... The teacher took away the note from him. Right. That that so the the message is for all of us, don't worry about getting it right. It's mm -hmm. going to be exactly what the way it needs to be and because of that daily auditing that takes place, tomorrow's another day every day. Nice. So we'll see you next Sunday on the we're, Sunday we're, version. We're going to keep answering your, your questions, your comments. Absolutely. We may, we may take a Monday, Tuesday hiatus, but we'll be back on Wednesday yeah. answering your questions. So continue to put them in the comments, or as always, you can put it on, email us at energyboost at Kabbalah.com. Thank you, Marcus. Thank, thank you, you, David. Thank, thank you. you, listeners. See you next week.